Uh, hi everybody, my name's Josh Waihi. Um, nice to see folks again. Um, I'm a, a director at Acquia. I work in the product management organization. Um, although I've been with Acquia now for about seven, seven and a half years, uh, for the longest time as a technical account manager, uh, moving into the product organization has been sort of a, a pretty new uh, move for me. Today, I wanted to talk about the uh, state of Drupal 7 Exodus uh, as we've sort of been seeing it from, from our side. Um, you know, Drupal 7 has been with us for like a really long time, pretty much a decade um, right now, which is crazy. Uh, I think there's probably a number of us that are a part of the Drupal community that maybe even remember when Drupal 7 came out, uh, which also speaks to how long we've been around. Um, I joined Drupal uh, in 2007 and started contributing to the community. Um, got my chance to contribute to Core as part of the database layer in Drupal 7. Got to celebrate that in Chicago in 2011 when it went live. Um, and you know, it was kind of the same time that the internet really kind of took off in a whole new way. And what I mean by that is um, just kind of give some people a, a, a walk down memory lane of like, what it was like uh, back way back then. Um, the iPhone 1 had just come out just before Drupal 7 had landed, and things like Google Maps on your phone didn't exist yet. Uh, and so there's like a real kind of um, kind of a testament to what was going on. I mean, the, the big thing, I think, at long, shortly after Drupal 7 landed was things like sharing and you know, embedding social media links onto your website. And a lot of uh, user traffic was driven by people coming to your website and then going from your website over to social media to engage or by liking posts that you were having, things like that. Of course, now the world's pretty different. Uh, we've got things like mobile first and headless strategies that uh, came much after the, uh, the release of Drupal 7. And yet, why is that all kind of significant? Uh, and you know, the, the real reason for that is, um, if I can get to my slides, this, uh, which is that to say that Drupal is Drupal 7 is still incredibly prevalent today in the industry. I think that speaks to a couple of a couple of reasons for that. One is uh, we had really long development life cycles back then. So it was you know about four years between Drupal 6 and Drupal 7, and another four years between Drupal 7 and Drupal 8. And so there was a lot of opportunity for the, uh, the adoption of Drupal to get onto Drupal 7. Uh, and since then, um, you know, it's been slowly adopted towards the 8 slash 9 architecture, but a lot of um, the sort of community or users of Drupal still sit on Drupal 7 today. At least that's what uh, the Drupal.org data tells us. This is a graph of Drupal uh, weekly project usage by core version, um, and this is literally taken from today so you can still see there's quite a substantial portion of um, of sites today reporting Drupal 7 usage um, this not may not be entirely accurate there's things like you know um, maybe people aren't using the update module as as much as they were in 7 because of things like composer but still points to a re relatively large amount of Drupal 7 usage um, when we look at other measurements in the market today um, builtwith.com uh, had sort of it finds that there is about 313,000 different uh, uh, Drupal 7 sites out there in a sort of production capacity. So, um, yes, yeah, even though the Drupal or all data might report things like other uh, non production environments, there are tools, still to, tools out there that can identify Drupal 7 sites and say that there's still a lot out there. If you think about um, the kind of cost to upgrade to Drupal 7 for all of those sites, it's somewhere in the, in the vicinity of about $4.6 billion. And you put that into the context of an end of life, uh, that's about the amount of um, yeah, money customers are going to, are going to spend um, getting off of Drupal 7 in the next sort of 12 to, to 36 months. Um, and so we have this sort of challenge that this tells us. And if we think about how many of our of our users use Drupal 7 today, um, yeah, keeping our Drupal 7 users requires us to find better ways to help them get to Drupal 9 or 10 because it's the best CMS, the easiest and the fastest path forward for them. Uh, I think that is like the, the real 
um, focus that I've been uh, thinking about in, in how our customers get off of 777 is where, where do they go? Um, of course, um, when you think about moving off of Drupal 7, because it is a migration and because it has been you know, potentially a decade since you last looked at refreshing your CMS, Drupal 9 may not be the only option available. Uh, and so this is also a really big risk to our community because it may be that, they, that the, some of those people go to other providers uh, and further sort of diminish the usage of Drupal across the internet. Um, so, yeah, I think the, this, this means to us as a community, we have a, a sort of stewardship role to play with the Drupal 7 uh, users um, to help them choose Drupal 9 uh, and to commit to a migration or an upgrade path to get from 7 to 9. Um, and making sure that in order to do that, we have to show how Drupal 9 is the best option in terms of it's the cheapest option, the provides the best value and we can get them there uh, in the fastest way. Um, so this is the sort of plan that we're putting together at Acquia on how we can help customers achieve that, uh, not just customers, but everybody in, in the Drupal community. So number one, we need to help Drupal 7 users plan their upgrade path. Um, so it's a really difficult thing for your know, migrations in general are really difficult. It's filled with a lot of unknown unknowns um, and it can be kind of tricky to know you know there's often a lot of data that doesn't need to migrate or working through a lot of things like that so we're going to do we've we've um, helped in two particular ways there one is through an automated migration assessment so this uh, assessment looks at a Drupal 7 site and it helps quantify the, 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 the data that you need to migrate so you know how many content types the the volumes of data that's published and unpublished, taxonomies, users, views, blocks, all of that kind of uh, you know, the common data that you'd be familiar with inside of Drupal, helping quantify a lot of that, um, showing which parts like the Migrate Accelerate will help migrate and which parts won't, so that uh, a conversation can be had with you know, with partners, with internal dev teams, and with the business about what the what's left over and what how we would go about migrating that. Um, Acquia has also, you know, had a lot of community contribution on the upgrade path, and that's by large because of the um, Acquia Migrate Accelerate uh, project. So that project has helped identify migration paths for a lot of different modules in the community, and it's helped provide a ton of patches into the community to help support that migration path as well. Um, and those, of course, are all available today in the community as well. Um, we, the second part of our, our plan is to make sure that they, the customer, has the resources to execute. So we help we want to we want to help our customers figure out how to, what sort of resources they need to have by building a partner accelerator program. So that's really around um, a specialization in Drupal seven migrations, making sure that we have you know, uh, competent partners that know how to do that. Um, and then the second way we do that is by uh, providing our Drupal 7 LTS long-term uh, support or VES uh, as it's known in Drupal.org, which is vendor extended support. And that basically gives uh, customers a longer runway to be able to get off of Drupal 7. So if they can't hit the end of life in November, 2022, there is a much longer runway that's currently planned out for 2025 that will help you know, give customers a longer, a longer time to figure out how to, how to get off Drupal 7. Um, uh, third part to the plan is to speed up execution by automating what is common. So again, um, that is a lot to do with Migrate Accelerator and being able to, um, you know, if, if something is migratable for one customer, we can do it the same for many customers, why not sort of automate that and make it common. So as our customers use our tools and you know, discover new things and new challenges, we look to take from those learnings and put them back inside of the tool. Um, there's also Acquia Site Studio, which uh, is a, uh, a site building tool that sort of you know, uh, uses low code, uh, as they talk about, or, or really it's like another way of empowering less site builders and less developers, but more people in the kind of content creation space to be able to build and control their site layouts by having a 
um, predefined sort of thing that they can build from uh, in, inside. So that's also another tool that's available to um, to customers who want to be able to you know, rebuild their their presentation layer, which they'll have to do as they move from seven to nine anyway. Uh, and then finally, making uh, make building with Drupal fast and powerful. Um, now that's something that I think Acquia has been committed to for quite a while now with the Drupal Acceleration team. Um, that's a team at Acquia that uh, com you know, commits basically 100% of its time to the contribution of uh, Drupal projects. So that's largely uh, things like Core, where we you know, help build out some uh, major features of, of Drupal Core. But it's also in the contra space with the Acquia Migrate uh, Accelerator program as well, which helps contribute a bunch of contra patches to, to help uh, the migration off of seven to nine as well. Um, another way that that could be useful is through Acquia CMS. We know today that um, compared to Drupal 7 and the type of websites we need to build back then, um, the sort of ecosystem that marketers need to build on is much, much greater. They need not just a Drupal site, they need to have lots of other you know, tools like personalization, data analytics, uh, all kind of integrated to the website and feeding into other systems as well. Uh, so Acquia CMS is a, a useful tool for customers who are wanting to leverage more of the Acquia platform uh, to, and easily connect into a lot of those other products that Acquia provides. Um, so here is also another way of looking at our, um, our current strategy for helping customers upgrade from seven. Um, so three ways to think about it. Where do we help in upgrade planning and upgrade execution? And how, how do we help in rebuilding and modernize? And then there's the three dimensions here about reducing costs, reducing time, and adding value. So the free assessments, making those automated and bringing in the partner accelerator program is going to help our customers and um, some of those you know, 300,000 sites out on the internet figure out ways of um, getting off of Drupal 7 and, and doing that in a context that, that sees them through to Drupal 9. The Migrate Accelerate program is then designed to make sure that getting to Drupal 9 is faster than migrating to some other CMS or some other project and really reducing the cost of migrate of the of a transition for customers um, completely. And then finally, the, the rebuild and modernize, and that's the option of using something like Site Studio or Acquia CMS to help leverage some of the more modern uh, functions and features that are in um, uh, that are you know, available today opposed to a decade ago in 2011. Um, so, sort of lastly, and maybe if you have looked at any Acquia Migrate Accelerator content in the past, you might have seen something like this before, which is you know, when you think about planning um, your, your migration, or at least a customer thinking about planning a migration, uh, you will see something like this. You typically spend about 25% of your time in analysis and planning, 25% um, of your time across DevOps and data reporting, and then 50% of your time reprogramming business logic and presentation. What we're really trying to aim for here with these sort of improvements and focus on the migration strategy is something more like this, where we can reduce a lot of time in the analysis and planning by uh, prov you're providing some upfront analysis, helping start a conversation, being able to um, migrate or uh, support the migration of a large number of contra modules that, are, that a, a customer may already be using. Um, then we also help uh, speed up the import process by you're providing a nice UI and a, a self-managed capability through Acquia Migrate Accelerator, and then also providing Acquia Cloud to help handle your DevOps architecture. Uh, finally, in terms of you know, improving the business logic and the presentation layers, uh, business logic can be a really difficult one to sort of say how we can uh, optimize it because it is very bespoke to the customer, but uh, an Acquia certified partner is someone who'd be able to help um, you know, navigate through that one quickly. Uh, and then Acquia Site Studio um, is a yeah, is a potential option for being able to expedite the presentation layer if that's the right direction to take for the for the use case. Um, so kind of um, wrapping up now, um, Drupal 7 is end of life, as I mentioned, November 2022. Um, the commercial extended support is through to end of 2025 or November, most precisely. And that's the VES program, Vendor Extended Support. Uh, you can see there's no Drupal 8 on here because Drupal 8, of course, is now end of life. 
and we have just drip, Drupal 7 and, and now Drupal 9 with the uh, advent of Drupal 10 coming out in Q2 of next year. Um, so we're here you know, in the um, sort of pip, uh, pink uh, square, and there is kind of like a small, a small or a closing window on this opportunity for getting these 300 plus you know, thousand um, sites that are Drupal 7 sites that are out on the internet to be able to bring them uh, across into Drupal 9. Um, if you have any questions, um, feel free to drop them into the uh, live Q&A or discussion forum. Happy to take an answer of those now. But if you wanted to get in touch with anybody about the PART program, uh, how to um, work with your know, customers here in APAC, uh, getting them from seven to nine, um, it'd be you know, great to uh, get in touch with either our country manager here, Keith Pettinger, or uh, our partner manager, Karina Kador. Um, I'll answer Q and A's in the um, in the discussion forum, but I will pass now over to Murray to, to go forward with convivial CMS. Thanks, Murray. Okay, thanks a lot, Josh. Uh, that was a really great presentation. I enjoyed that one. Um, so yeah, just a, a quick reminder there, if you would uh, like to ask Josh some questions, yeah, please do that in the, uh, the live Q&A. And I would also encourage you to do the same thing uh, for my presentation as well. Um, please um, just uh, <laughs> ask away and I'll answer uh, at the end. So, okay. Uh, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Murray Woodman. I'm the uh, Managing Director at Morphed and we're a Sydney-based uh, Drupal agency. Um, thanks so much for coming along today to find out uh, a little bit more about Convivial CMS. Uh, Convivial is a starter uh, website that we use uh, at Morphed to, uh, you know, build out our uh, customer sites. And uh, I realized today we probably have uh, two kinds of audiences. Well, that's what I thought when I was writing this speech, but I, I, we probably have one kind of audience really, and that is the uh, Drupal developer. So maybe you guys are more interested in finding out about some of the, the patterns or techniques uh, that we've used. And certainly um, I'll be running through some of those things uh, as well. But if you're a you know, potential customer who's you know, interested in uh, some of the features of uh, Convivial, I've got a very uh, sort of quick demo of a, a couple of its um, features to, to have a look at. So what is Convivial? Well, it's certainly not a cookie cutter site um, where we just install it and expect, you know, one one distro to, to solve all problems. It really is a set of techniques and patterns that we use inside Morphed. And so um, it's fair to say that, uh, you know, as the years have gone by, what we do is we continuously, continuously improve um, the way we uh, develop uh, Drupal websites. And of course, this is not an unfamiliar thing uh, for Drupal agencies. Um, certainly, it makes sense to have a, a little toolkit there of uh, all, all of your best practices. But when we're developing uh, Convivial, because we are using it as a set of techniques, it means that we're able to uh, implement different uh, design systems uh, on top of that. So, for example, on the, uh, the left-hand side there, we have Bootstrap 5. This is our latest and great, greatest version of um, of Convivial, and um, you know it allows us to utilize uh, any module um, we want. And this is really where we're road testing a lot of our personalization and customization uh, features. So that really is the the cutting edge of what we're doing. But we also have other versions of uh, Convivial as well. So we've got Convivial for Gov CMS over on the right hand side. So that's a, a GovCMS 9 SAS uh, implementation, which uses the Australian government design system, or most recently as it's been forked uh, to being called gold. So um, we do have a, uh, yeah, a GovCMS 9 um, version. Uh, they're ready to go if that's, uh, if that's what you're looking for. And then most recently, you know, for the New South Wales government, they have the New South Wales digital design system. Um, they're currently on version two of that, and we, we do have an implementation um, for that. Uh, version three is, will be released soon, and we're currently working on doing a, a full version three implementation of 
the New South Wales digital design system. So hopefully you can see that, yeah, it's not really a one size or just sort of one distro. It really is, a, you know, a collection of best practices um, that we have and uh, we can roll them out to different uh, design systems. But yeah, it's fair to say the one on the left, the, the Bootstrap 5 one is, is where the most activity is. Before I jump into the demo, I'd like to just touch on a few uh, different sort of layers. Um, and these are the things we're thinking about when we're trying to build, uh, you know, a starter kit, um, because you're not really trying to solve a specific use case. You're really trying to design for something more uh, generic in general. Um, so, you know, at the top, we have the style guide or the, the branding of the organization. And this is where color palettes and typography and these kinds of things are defined, uh, you know, as a thing, it, it exists on its own and it's specific to the organization. And on top of that, we have the design system, and this is where the patterns and components are defined from small things like atoms, like buttons, all the way up to um, organisms, such as you know, full page uh, templates. Um, we really like using design systems because uh, you know it makes uh, this process you know a whole lot better. You're standing on the the shoulders of giants, and uh, you have a, you know a known sort of set of functionality that you can target. Coming down into the implementation section, this is where Drupal fits into the picture. I'd like to break that up into two parts. You know, the first one is fairly obvious. That's the structure. How do you, you know, implement those components? And of course, they're going to map fairly closely into what the design system uh, is offering. But I think the really interesting area is around the editor controls or what I call degrees of freedom. Um, you're able to look at the style guide and the design system and work out which parts of those you want to expose to editors. You know, what's going to give, uh, you know, an editor that expressive freedom to tell the stories they want to tell? And uh, how can you provide um, that freedom in really easy to use, uh, you know, options that that editor is able to select? So that's very much part of our philosophy has morphed is that we're trying to, you know, build an editor experience uh, you know, based around configuration rather than necessarily a developer or a, a thema uh, sort of driven um, way of uh, styling sites. Okay, um, and then some principles here. So, you know, I've I've spoken about this kind of stuff over the years, cross-cutting uh, concerns. Um, and these really the things that run across all of your content types uh, in the website. So I think if you can nail all of these things, you're really, uh, you know, building a system that is going to be scalable for the future. If you have consistency and, uh, you know, coherency with these, you're going to have a system that will be able to scale out to easily add in new content types and to, um, you know, build, build a site based on a very solid foundation. Some of them are to do with content modeling, others are to do with, you know, components. Um, but these are all of the things that you've, you've really got to get um, all working together. The flip side of this is that we avoid vertical concerns. So Convivial is not a, um, a solution in an individual vertical. It's not really solving one particular application. It is just a set of uh, sort of common um, patterns that we're using. I'm a firm believer in that each site, each project has its own problems uh, and they need to be solved. Uh, in their own way. And the way you do that is through content types and taxonomy. So we really make no commitments to, to content types. That's not what we're about. And in a similar vein, we have, um, um, when we're working with uh, the different components that we're implementing, I'm calling it pattern smell here, but similar to um, you know code smell, you can basically look at a piece of code or a component and work out, you know, is that making our sense is it consistent you know is it breaching some rule and i think when it comes to snowflakes or you know oddities i think if you see those things that's a time to pause step back work out uh you know if you can generalize it if you can encapsulate it and then finally can you then expose that to the editor to um to uh, you know to build the sites that they want um, I'm, I'm bringing up freedom and safety here as well, because these are two guiding principles about, you know, um, how we've built uh, Convivial. Um, both of them are good things, right? You want freedom and you want safety, you know. Um, you know, it's, it's a little bit like the welfare state and democracy, you know, they're both good, but there's a, a balance and a, a bit of a, um, 
uh, you know, tension there sometimes. Another way to look at it is, you know, how can we give editors enough rope, but not quite enough to, uh, to hang themselves? So yeah, on the safety side of things, these are all the things we want to guarantee in a, in a distro, right? And we want to make sure the site is on brand, accessible, responsive, secure, consistent, and performant. But we also don't want editors to feel that they're in a straight jacket and can't, you know, build the kinds of content uh, that they want. So each of those things on the right are essentially, you know, the degrees of freedom that we're able to open up to um, editors, you know, based on what is in the design system and in the uh, and in the style guide. So yes, there are a couple of uh, sort of principles that we're doing um, in the demo I'm about to show you, and I promise I will get there eventually. Um, what you're going to see is Convivial, which is a starter kit that Morphed uses on its own client projects. But I really do want to say that a lot of the stuff we've developed over the years has been released as open source. So each of these modules here are things that we have released. And this really does form the core of um, the way we uh, sort of build a lot of our sites. So the first three you see there, they are really all about separating um, presentation from uh, content. And that's probably the first phase of Convivial is working out how can we make a, a really good editor experience. Each one of those three modules is in GovCMS, by the way, and this does allow us to um, build GovCMS sites the way that we do. Um, the final four um, modules that you see there are really more around personalization and customization. We're particularly proud of the work we've done on Personified and JSON Template, because this allows us to do um, deliver personalized experiences, and we'll see that very soon, uh, as well as Recombi and Sajari. Uh, Recombi is an AI-powered recommendation engine. It's a really easy way to get up, up and running with uh, item recommendations to your users, um, and you'll be seeing uh, that very soon as well. So yeah, there we have it, the, the, sort of the two phases of um, of what we've been uh, delivering with Convivial. So yes, we're there now. This is um, the demonstration. And I'm going to show you two guys two things. Firstly, the editor experience. And um, you know, secondly, a little bit around uh, personalization. So we're going to flip over to um, the Convivial demo site now. And what you see here is a test or a demo site of a bookstore. and. I've chosen this domain because, you know, books have topics and they have audiences and authors, and there's there's quite a few dimensions there which around which we can um, personalize. So I'll be showing a little bit of the personalization soon, but before before we do, um, I will just go in and show a, a tiny bit of the editor experience. So here we are in the back end. Um, I've just created a very simple page here uh, called demo. And the demo page is um, a very simple listing of what we're calling um, big teasers, right? So um, fairly, fairly uh, simple um, uh, design. This has been built uh, with a paragraph called the node list. So we're going to go in and have a look at uh, just how that's working. So I'll just scroll down to the components here. Now, what you're going to notice immediately is this UI looks different to the normal paragraphs um, view of the world. Um, paragraphs UI is usually all around form elements and, and nested uh, form elements, essentially. What we have here is the layout paragraphs module uh, in play. And layout paragraphs uh, has two main features. The first is that it allows um, you to embed different layouts into your paragraphs. So you can kind of think of it as like a little bit like a section uh, in Layout Builder, but that's um, the way you know we can inject layouts into paragraphs. But the other really cool feature is that it does have this WYSIWYG kind of experience. So you're actually seeing the rendered entities here of, of these nodes um, in the node edit form. And for me, that's a big win. I'm a believer that editors should be working in the node edit form, not necessarily in a, you know an overridden um, layout. So let's let's come in here and um, edit this. So as we see, this is a uh, our demo content for a, a node list. I'm going to hide that heading, and here we have the the content here. Now we're not going to change the content. The content's important. What we're worried about here is changing the presentation. So these are what I'm calling the degrees of freedom. So the first one here is we we've got a view mode. Okay, this is a big teaser. Let's change that to an image card. 
Now this particular field here is handled by the entity reference display module, one of the open source ones I mentioned before. Um, then we've got the color palettes, right? So let's change this to the light color palette. So this color palette is defined in the style guide and has been implemented here. And this has been done with the entity field, sorry, <laughs> entity class formatter. Sorry about that. This is the entity class formatter handling this. This will just drop a class onto the entity. And we're also using another similar approach here, but we got, you know, some styles that maybe we want to um, show or hide on this particular one. Here we're using the breakout class to break it out of the container. Um, we have a layout. So rather than doing alternating items, let's, let's have them as thirds. Okay, so we've configured a few of those options up there. Uh, we, we click Save on that. And you can see that the, uh, the display is immediately being updated. That's great editor um, feedback, good user experience to see, uh, to have a preview of what that's, uh, that's going to look like. So we'll do save. We'll come back. We can see we've, we've got our node list. Um, you know, the, the content is broken out of the container. We've got the light gray background here. We've got the changes in the layout. We've got the changes in the view mode. So these are all the different dimensions that we're exposing. And these dimensions have come from the design system and the uh, the style guide, and they've been implemented. And this really is our main aim: is to take those dimensions and to to um, expose them to editors. So really, that's that's just a, a quick sort of demo of some of the principles that under underlie uh, Convivial and how we've uh, you know approached the building of it. Flipping over to the uh, the home page now, we're going to have a look at some of the personalization um, features. So, you know, one of the goals we had with Convivial was to build a site with a homepage that was 100% um, personalized. Now, you may not want to do this on every, every site you build. You may only want to personalize one or two um, blocks. Uh, but, you know, here we've kind of gone a bit overboard and, and um, we've done it for absolutely everything. So before I just show you the page, I, I just want to show you that this is a little bit of the stuff that's going on under the hood. So essentially, there's some local storage variables that are, are being stored on this page. And we have like essentially user context that's stored um, there locally. And each one of these variables is uh, driving what you're about to see on the, uh, on the site. So for example, I visited this site 212 times and the system thinks, okay, that's pretty high experience this person likes the site. So essentially this tag is then able to drive the experiences that we're going to see um, on the site. Um, we have an IP geo, geo IP lookup. It knows that I'm in Australia. It knows it's therefore spring. And, um, you know, that's able to, to you know, drive um, the, you know, the time of year. And just interestingly here, we, we've sort of got some affinity kinds of um, uh, topics here where the system's able to work out, you know, what topic I'm interested in and um, what audience group I'm interested in. So if, if we have a look at what's going on here, this top block um, is driven by the experience level. So you can see I'm on the high experience level, but it's saying, hey, why don't you go to the next level and, you know, get in touch with us, basically. So there's a bit of a call to action there. Uh, these next promo blocks are based around the affinity we have. So this one here is based on my topic affinity. It knows I'm interested in sci-fi, so it's going to, you know, basically promote some sci-fi stuff to me. Uh, likewise, the second one here is an audience affinity. It knows I like youth content, therefore it's going to serve me up a youth block. So all of this stuff that you're seeing here is, um, you know, done in a decoupled way, you know, with JavaScript on the client side getting that context and, and pulling the content out of Drupal. The next block you see here is all around uh, recommendations coming out of Recombi, uh, which is a you know, recommender as a service. Uh, Recombi has taken my click trail across the site. It's also taken the click trail of everyone else who's been on the site, and it's worked out what I would be uh, interested in. Uh, so if you have a, a site with a large corpus of information that's um, you know, got some metadata attached and you would like to use the wisdom of the crowd, you know, Recombi's a, a great uh, a great approach for that. Um, finally, down the bottom, we have a, a block here promoting um, something to do with spring. Hey, it's spring, why don't you come out of hibernation? So this is 
giving you an idea of you know how you can have um, that kind of call to action. So yeah, that was a very quick run through of some of the personalization uh, features there. It, it is important to note that um, there is some pretty smart JavaScript under the hood working out this kind of stuff. You might want to think of it as like kind of like a CDP light, you know, written in in JavaScript. It's basically uh, sort of a very simple way, relatively simple way of, of keeping track of this data to uh, to personalize the experiences. Okay, so coming back um, back to the presentation. I'm almost at the end, so get those questions ready, everyone. Um, so let's just look to the future. You know, I think, you know, Drupal's 20 years old, right? And uh, this conference is all about, you know, reaching that milestone and, and looking ahead. Um, so Drupal's come from the area of, era of the CMS, um, but I think it's it really is moving into the next era of the CXP, that's the content experience platform. Um, where Drupal's not just used as you know a manager of um, of content as a CMS, but it's actually serving out experiences to different uh, different channels. And uh, by taking this decoupled approach, and by having sort of the concept of different channels, uh, different audiences, and different topics, we're able to you know get Drupal to operate in this CXP kind of way. And I really, that's what the next phase of Convivial is going to be all about. It's it's building it out as an omni-channel content experience um, platform. And so, you know, as development proceeds on it, you know, we'll be working out, um, building out some more of those kinds of features. Uh, so that's it. That's um, my presentation um, there. I'm pretty easy to find on the, the web. Um, my, my handle is Murray W. So I'm on the, uh, the Drupal Slack, Twitter, and uh, Drupal.org uh, with that handle. I'd love to, uh, you know, hear any questions uh, that you've got there. Um, of course, you can check out uh, Convivial CMS on the Morphed website as well if you'd like to um, do that. I'm just looking at look at the time. It looks like we've got nine minutes up our sleeves, and uh, I really uh, appreciate that time so I can answer a few of your questions. So I'm just going to come back now, and uh, hopefully I'll be able to come in and uh, see what questions you guys have been asking there. Uh, and I encourage you to um, ask away. So I'm looking in the uh, the Q and A there. I'm not seeing any any questions bubble up, but I will uh, check the forum. Okay, nothing in the forum. So if you guys have any questions there, please please drop them into the forum or the live Q and A, and I'm happy to answer them. Oh, there's one in the live Q and A. Thank you, hi Lee. Thank you. How do you feel about Layout Builder and Paragraphs? So we are using Layout Builder and Paragraphs. Um, thanks for that one, uh, Lee. Um, and it's you know if if you look at what Morph has done over the years, it's it's really been hilarious. You know we we started off with paragraphs and then we went to panels IPE and then we flipped back to to um, to paragraphs and then we went to Layout Builder and then we've come back to to paragraphs. So. Um, we've really enjoyed implementing everything twice as a block and a paragraph about four, t four times in our history. Um, but yeah, our current recipe is using um, Layout Builder. You know, we do enjoy using Layout Builder as essentially what the Site Builder is using across the view modes. Um, but I do prefer to use paragraphs for what the editors are working with on the Node uh, Node Edit screen. So. Like we're sort of happy with that layout paragraphs module and uh, the experience um, that's got. I, I do think it's better for editors to, to feel that they're in that node edit form rather than doing things presentationally um, in layout builder. But you know, I understand people have different opinions on that, but that's really where we've uh, sort of landed on that one. And Bevan. Is information for these features processes available? Are there particular modules we can have a look? <laughs> it's probably dangerous me reading the questions out live, Bevan. You could have put anything in there, and I would have read it out. Um, well, yeah. So the, I mean, those modules that I've I've I listed uh, in the presentation, you know, have been released as contrib, and I've I probably have presented on them, um, uh, you know, at various conferences and uh, and things like that over the years. Um, no doubt the documentation could be uh, improved on some of those, um, on Bevan. But yeah, that, that's what I'm trying to do here is yeah show the way uh, 
we're uh, addressing some of these things. Um, th there's a whole stack of other modules that we are using for editor experience as well, which I really didn't get to, to touch on. Um, for instance, the, uh, the moderation sidebar, you may have seen that up the top right hand side. That's a pretty cool module. I can't believe you know, that's not on every single um, site as well. So, you know, there are yeah, a number of uh, contrib modules out there, obviously, that do uh, improve the editor experience. OK, um, so I do have another question here. Can a history of transactions and purchases when integrated with CRMs or Salesforce be used for personalization as well as navigation? So yeah, this is a really uh, interesting um, one. And you know that, that's something we've actually been looking at at Morphed. We're looking uh, at releasing a, a module called Enricher, which is actually a connector between things like CRMs and um, marketing software you know, down into Drupal, which is meant to act as a bridge you know, going from one down into the other so we can um, get access to that user profile. So I think, yeah, pulling that profile out of, you know, a secure store and, and bringing that down into that local storage and being able to personalize around that um, is definitely something we want to do. I don't really want to see content stored in Salesforce or a marketing software or a, or a CDP and then just getting injected into Drupal in a dumb kind of way. I want to see Drupal being a first class citizen for managing the, the content and being able to serve that content from Drupal. And for me, the aim is to try to get that profile information from the CRM um, down into the uh, down into Drupal. So that is an open source module. We do hope to um, release that, um, you know, in the near future. Um, but you know, of course, you've got Salesforce, you know, integrations and things like that that you can run um, for logged in users. But yeah, a lot of the work we've been doing has been based around anonymous uh, users. Not sure if that's answered the the question, but I think you know that is kind of like the holy grail, isn't it? Is having that sort of that rich user profile, that first party data that you've got in the CRM, and making that available in the website, and that is that the aim of the the game basically. So you have to work out how to um, to do that bridge, and that's what this enricher module is uh, is trying to do, and yeah, that's what we'll release soon. Okay, uh, one more. Are Recombi and Sajari open source or proprietary? So firstly, they're software as a service. You go sign up for them. You know, you're going to pay uh, whatever, 100 bucks a month or something for them. So they're quite price competitive um, from that um, perspective. Uh, Morphed has released a couple of open source modules there. Um, Recombi, sorry, Search API Recombi, Search API Sajari. So we've got the backend uh, integrations uh, with their indexes. And we've also got modules that will expose blocks for those so that you can play, place them um, on the page. So yeah, that's open source. So um, I encourage you to have a look at that. You know, there's a bit of setup for them, right? You've got to push the index across and you've got to put the block on the page. Um, but uh, yes, they are open source, but the service. And... OK, guys, so we've got two minutes to go and uh, I've run through all of the questions. Are there any final things there that people would like to ask? I'll flip across to the forum. Um, OK, so Lee's made a little comment there. Thanks, Lee. And back on the questions. No other questions there. <laughs> I, might, uh, I might leave it there if there's nothing else. But uh, so I'd like to say, yeah, thank you so much to everyone uh, for coming along today and as i said i'm more than happy to to uh, talk about this or anything else we've really just sort of scratched the, the surface there but hopefully i've given you a bit of an idea of um, what we've been working on and what's possible so thanks a lot everyone and enjoy the rest of the conference